All right, well, good evening and good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from in the country today. In fact, let us know in the chat. My name is Johanna silva Walkie, and I'm the Vice President of Training and Community Engagement here at EMILY's List. And I wanna welcome you to our very special event on Women's History Month, as we celebrate the leadership of change makers. Um, I'm excited to kick off our event today, and we're joined by Stephanie Shriok, president of EMILY's List, who will be in conversation with Ashanti Kohler, president of Emerge, about Stephanie's new book, Run to Win, Lessons in Leadership for Women Changing the World. We're also going to hear from a distinguished panel of EMILY's List candidates whose stories of determination, persistence, resistance, and triumph are highlighted in Stephanie's book. And we'll take questions from you, our audience. So please use the Q&A chat box below to submit any questions that you have for us today. Many of you may have heard that after 11 years as president of EMILY's List, Stephanie announced a few months ago that at the end of March, she would be stepping down as president of the organization, which makes this event even more special. As Stephanie always says, you never really leave EMILY's List because you're always part of the family but also because we leave our mark. And Stephanie's mark is nothing short of impactful. We are so lucky to have had the chance to work with her and get the benefit of her work, and we're going to miss her. But we're also very happy to be hosting this event with her today and all of our guests, so let's get started. I want to first introduce our first two speakers. Uh, first, we have our partner, a great friend and partner with of Emily's List, Ashanti Kohler, who serves as the president of Emerge, where she leads the organization and steers its overall strategy and direction, overseeing a national staff as well as affiliates across the country in their work recruiting and training Democratic women to run for office. For over 15 years, Ashanti has been a grassroots organizer and activist for women, communities of color, and progressive causes. She's also the founder of the Brown Girls Guide to Politics, an award-winning podcast. Ashanti is joined by Stephanie Shriok, who will talk about the leadership lessons she shares in her new book. Raised in a copper mining town of Butte, Montana, Stephanie has been working to get Democrats elected for 25 years. During her tenure as president of EMILY's List, the organization endorsed more than 1,800 women elected nearly 1,000 women up and down the ballot and trained more than 14,000 women. Stephanie led the expansion of our state and local and trainings program, including our online training center and the creation of Run to Win, our national recruitment and training campaign. Thanks to her leadership, EMILY's List is now more than nearly 5 million members strong. Ashanti and Stephanie, welcome. Stephanie, I know you want to say a few words before we get started with our program, so I'll leave um, the time to you. Thank you so much, Johanna, and thank you for that beautiful introduction of, of both of us. It's an honor always uh, to be with you and it's a shining example of how great our staff is, so thank you so much. Uh, I did want to just take a very brief moment here because I think it is important uh, to take pause when we go through yet again another tragedy in this nation. And unfortunately, it happens all too often, one mass shooting after another on top of systemic racism and it's growing and growing. Uh, so in that vein, I just wanted to say that our, our hearts go out to those who lost loved ones in Colorado just a few days ago, and, and those who lost loved ones in Atlanta just last Friday, heart goes out to people who lose loved ones every day to needless gun violence that happens across this country. It is one of the reasons we do the work we do every single day because we must change laws so we can change culture and we need women to lead the way. So with that, I just think on, on this one moment, please remember those families, think about those families as you continue the work of supporting everything that we do. And as you think about your own journey as a public official. So thank you and thank you for allowing me this moment. And with that, I will 
hand it over to my friend, Ashanti. Stephanie, thank you for your words as always and your incredible leadership. I'm just really excited to be here today in conversation with you. I remember when I saw the first tweet that you had a book coming out and I immediately knew, okay, this is being added to my list. <laughs> a book I recommend to women who want to run for office or who want leadership skills. And I didn't even need to read it. I just knew it was immediately going to give them all the information that they needed. So thank you for taking the time to share your knowledge, your passion, just everything you have done to uplift women. I just truly appreciate you so much. Well, thank you. I mean, the truth is, and you get you have this too, right? We have some of the best jobs in the entire country because we get to work with amazing women every day and with each other. And how how cool is that? That that is one of the best blessings, and we really do have those blessings. It absolutely is because you know people ask me all the time, you know, how are you doing? How are you getting through the quarantine through the pandemic? And I'm like, it's the women, the women who are running for office, who are introducing this great policy, who are actually helping us get out of this pandemic, because I don't know what some of these men governors be doing. You need to be watching the ladies. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's what has kept me going. Me too. Me too. It's so true. So let's dive into right. our interview, our questions. Okay. So we know that everyone starts somewhere. Like we always hear those women who come to us are like, I want to be like Speaker Pelosi. I want to be like Stacey Abrams. And we're like, you can totally be like them. But they also started somewhere and they've had this great elevation. So let's talk about your story, which actually starts in Butte, Montana. Tell us about the path that led you to politics and to be the president of the Millie's List. Well, I never, I never knew where I would end up, which was always some of, some of the fun part of the path, uh, for sure. Also, kind of just a shout out, I'm loving the Stacey Abrams photo behind you. I love, we, I know we love our Stacey Abrams. I just love, so cool, so cool. Sorry, I just had, I had a fangirl a moment with that photo behind you. <laughs> It's amazing. It's amazing. And she's amazing. Uh, and, and what we remind people all the time is like for all of the folks who want to be just like Stacey Abrams, what we tell them is we want you to be you because we need your story. And as I started my journey, you know, I grew up in this copper mining town. It was a union town. So we were stewed in workers' rights right from the beginning. And you were either with you're with the workers or are you with the company? And in my family, that wasn't even a question. You were with the workers, like period, done, end of question. And that's, that's how I was raised. And I always wanted to be involved in everything. I was, I admit, that girl who like ran for all the class president offices and lost all of them. I talk about that a little bit in the book. You survive, you survive. Oh, uh, you know, I was, you know, I was a Girl Scout. I was the head of the youth group at the church. You know, I just always wanted to be involved and I loved it. I particularly love student government and, and for those younger women uh, who may be on, who still are in school, I give a huge shout out to student government because I learned so much through student government, both in high school, even though I lost all those class president elections, they always gave me like a honorary post. I, <laughs> I did win my student body. I did. I pulled out my student body president election going into my senior year because I finally figured out that I needed to change the electorate. I needed a bigger electorate to go after. <laughs> So the, I'm still grateful to the sophomores and the freshmen of Butte High School that supported my candidacy, <laughs> which is when I thought maybe I should be more on the campaign management side of the equation than the candidate side of the equation. And so as I continued on, I, that's how I got involved. I got involved in democratic politics really early, volunteered uh, in high school, uh, was engaged in college at Mankato State University in Minnesota. 
and had an opportunity to um, work on my very first job for a woman who was running for Congress in Minnesota, Mary Reeder. Um, unfortunately, no longer with her, with us. Wonderful, wonderful lady. And I became her finance director. I had no idea what I was doing, like none. But I said yes, because I was young enough to just take that risk. And also I was like, oh, we'll learn it. Because that's the other thing. We talk about this in the book, like you can learn this on the job. Like we can do trainings and we'll train you. But the truth is until you do it, until you jump into the job, you're not really gonna understand how all the pieces go together. So what, just do it, just jump and we can help you through. So that's how I got started. And ever since I've been fundraising, I became a campaign manager and found my way uh, to Emily's List. So I love that story because Ashanti also didn't win her student government elections. <laughs> I'm telling you, right? We made it, look at us, you lose a few races, it's okay. We're still doing all right, but I'm just like, I would say I so. why I love Stephanie because we never talked about that. So here's another thing that we have in common. I just love it so much. When you start growing your thick skin early that way, you know, it's like, here's the thing about elections and in life, you know, you're going to grow a little bit of thick skin. Doesn't mean you lose your passion or your compassion. That's right. Like, so you got to be tough and you got to toughen up a little bit. Yeah. And I was just like, all right high school politics, not for me. Let me try this college stuff. So much more fun. Yes. College, college student government. Amazing. Amazing. So, much more fun. so in the book, so many gems, but one of my favorite chapters in Run to Win is called Break the Rules, Break Out the Box, because you share that some of your favorite unwritten rule breakers are the brave women who become the first, but we also know not the last. So who are some of the first who inspire you the most? I mean, it's, it has been one of the more overwhelming things at Emily's List uh, because there's also a part of me, you know, because it's been the last 11 years. I came in in 2010. And yet, how many firsts have we had still? Right. In the lab, right? Like we still are breaking through ceilings in places you know, we have, you know, over 20 states that have never had women governors. So it's like, ah, so I, I will never forget the moment. I mean, I still get chills about it when Sharice Davids mm -hmm. and Deb Holland, the first two Native American women to win a seat in the U.S. House came in together, 2018 election, were sworn in in 2019. You know, growing up in, Mon in Montana, you know, and, and, trying to understand, you know, as a child, why there was this great separation of, of white people and Native American people and, and wanting, wanting to learn and do something about this and to be able to say, I had a little part of Sharice Davis and Deb Holland's career and they've inspired so many. I, every time I go home, honestly, I run into folks uh, who I've met along the way who belong to one of the many tribes in Montana and they know Sharice Davids from Kansas. They know Deb Holland, even in Montana. Like that's the power of this. That's what's so extraordinary. The first two Muslim women also came in that year, um, Congresswoman Omar and uh, Talib. And that it's, it's so hard to be what you can't see. And it really is truly inspiring, which gets me to the, the ultimate big first that I think will, I think we will look back in years to come to realize the, the momentum expansion that this election of Vice President Kamala Harris will mean for the future of this country. Like, I think we're in it at the moment. I think it's too soon to tell exactly what's gonna happen. But I'm telling you, every time we win, every time we break through a ceiling, you know, and you go through and you gotta do it different. You gotta do it your own way. You've gotta break some, you gotta break some rules because all those rules were set up by old white guys that have been running the show for 250 years or, or you know, centuries in many places. Long. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Except for when they weren't and the women were running the show and they got pushed out. So it's, it is a amazing moment right now that I see. And it's because there's a willingness for women to try to do it their way. And that's what we need. We don't want to be, we don't want to do it their way. You know, the men's way, I grew up in that era in the 1990s in Washington, DC. I had my masculine looking Navy suit and my like, you know, tacky pearls. That was the only thing feminine you could wear in the 90s. And you just you like, you literally had a bob cut and you look like a dude. And that's not what this is about. And that's what's so amazing about this moment is women get to be women and run for office in all of their strength and power and feminine strength, which is ultimately, in my mind, the most powerful of all power. Yes, and I'm just so inspired by what you said, just showing up as your authentic self. And especially when we talk about Interior Secretary Holland, she tells everyone she didn't plan to run for office at all, then became one of the first indigenous women in Congress, now the first indigenous cabinet secretary it's just, it's amazing. And I absolutely love working with you at Emerge and Emily's List because you just have such a great team. Like Johanna, I love you girl. Just enjoy everyone so much. So I do want to talk about building a great team. You know, Johanna was just talking about your resume and all you accomplished. That's just like, wow. Like you were able to lead all of that with your team. And we tell our women when they run for office too, your network is super important, but you got to have that team beside you. So what advice do you have for the women who want to run for office about building that team? And then after this question, we are going to take some of your audience questions. Okay, perfect. I mean, the team is so important because, you know, first you got to, you got to, Dif you know, di differentiate the team that's going to come and make sure that you're doing everything right, that you can, that you can trust, that can guide you. These are the people like Johanna, Emily Kane, who's our executive director. These Christina Reynolds, my co-writer on this book, who's the vice president of communications. I want to hire people who are better than me in the areas they know, because otherwise, why, why would I need them? I need the best. I need the best so I can do my job and then let everybody do their jobs. That's the key. And then you got to be build the trust. And loyalty is not a one-way street. It is, it is a partnership. It is getting to know each other. It is proving to each other, not just a leader demanding loyalty, but that that leader actually needs to, needs to prove that they are loyal to that team. So that is really important. And then we talk about it a lot. I know when uh, you know, Emerge and Emily's List sit down with candidates, a lot of like, you, you want to hire professionals if you can, or get folks who have specialties that you need if you're running for a local office. Uh, then you got your friends. Most of the time, I'm going to be honest, those are different people. <laughs> they just are, right? I'm just going to say, <laughs> like, I mean, the friends, you need your friends. Yeah. And what you don't always want is your friend being the one who has to tell you that you got to get up at six in the morning to go do the radio show, right? Like you don't want that. So you need your friends though, who are going to be there on the bad days and the good days to celebrate the victories, to be honest with you when things aren't working out. You need the friends. That's super important, but you also need the professional team. Even in a volunteer setting, you want to find volunteers that can do a piece of the work that needs to be done and that and read through that chapter there isn't there isn't anybody in any kind of leadership role forget about running for office if you're going into an organization in your workplace where you got to put together a team i think there's bits in there for everybody that can help you there is and i 100 percent agree with everything you said especially hire really smart people and get out of their way let, yeah. let them do their thing it's only going to make things better. So we got some really great audience questions. So this first one, we hear this one a lot. This is from Taylor from New Jersey. 
She says, I come from a Republican family and I'm looking at running for a town board the next cycle. My family does not support me running for office or think I would ever be ready. Do you have any advice on how to get your family to support the race? Oh, that's a good question. That's a good question. I'm gonna guess they can't be your whole family. So you might need to find some, I'm gonna say, find some weak links in the family because here's the thing, you are ready. You're definitely ready. Don't let them tell you you're not ready and you can learn everything you need to do, to, to, to do this. So I would say running for office is, we're not trying to get to Mars here. I mean, NASA's getting to Mars and I'm really, I think that's really cool, but that seems hard to me. <laughs> this, this is actually all about people and getting to know people and getting to know your community and having conversations and listening to what's going on and then building out, organizing a group of folks who will work with you. That's what this is all about. And I think if you share with your family that you know how to put those pieces together and a little bit of your vision on why it's important, even if they're Republicans. I'll tell you, I got a lot of Republicans in my family too. I got a lot of Midwestern Republicans, but they're so proud of me. And I know if I needed them, they would back me up. So just because they're of a different party, they're still your family. And sometimes you just need to show your bravery for them to see you in a different light. So you decide to run, they will see you differently. And I think for the most part, there's always exceptions to this, I know. You'll be surprised how many will come along with you. Yes, absolutely. We see it all the time. You know, we had an alum who was just really struggling with her Republican family wanting to run for office and she won and she sent me photos of them like pre-COVID at her election night party. And like, they were excited. They were cheering, they were clapping, they were eating all the meatballs. So they will come along. They will come along. They will, they will. And, right, and they will eat all the meatballs. I'll, I'll be the first to eat all the food. Yes. <laughs> Yep, you're right. Where all the food go? That was my family. <laughs> Our next question comes from Janice from Georgia. Another question that we hear a lot. What type of background credentials qualifies you to run for office? Are you breathing? Right. <laughs> you alive? You care about your community? Good. Check. Done. Yeah. We, we, I know for so long, particularly women, were, were told or it was assumed that you'd have to have a law degree or you'd have to have a certain understanding of all the, all the issues. The truth is, if you're willing to learn and ask questions, if you care, and I'm not joking about that, if you deeply care about your community, because these jobs, I, I'm not going to gloss over it. They're hard. It's hard to run, it's hard to serve, but it is also glorious. It is joyful. You meet the most amazing people, but you gotta, you gotta know what's driving you. So a set of values that can always be your North Star, I think is really, really important. Beyond that, if you can read or get somebody or get information, you're gonna be fine. You're gonna be fine because the truth is nobody who's elected knows everything that is going on in their community. That's why they have meetings and constituents who come in to, you know, they call it lobbying for a reason, but even locally organizing, we've done this, Shandi, in our lives, where we've gone in to talk about breast cancer research or gone in, because the members, no one knows everything. I don't know everything. I need to keep learning too. So that's, that's part of the deal. If you're willing to listen and ask a lot of questions, you can do this. So right, and our final question comes from Wilmette from Delaware. Wilmette is in her early 50s and wants to know, is it too late to start a political career? Is it best to run for city, county, or state seats? 
Okay, first off, Nancy Pelosi just screamed at that question somewhere. I don't know where she is, but she's <laughs> like, Nancy Pelosi, who waited until all four of her five children were out of the house before she ran, who's now the Speaker of the United States House. There is no, Donna Shalala, Donna Shalala, who ran for office for the first time at, what was she, I don't even know, it's like, let's say late 70s for the first time. Now she's in, you know, she's serving in other ways, but still, I'm just saying, no, age, young, old, middle, start. That's a great way to do it. Don't worry about that. In fact, isn't it better if we have different age people? We talk about diversity all the time and we need diversity in race. We need diversity in profession. We need diversity in class and we need diversity in age. Like, because otherwise how, how are we going to know what's really affecting different generations without that voice at the table? So I'm glad you're thinking about it. And the truth is, there's no easy answer between a, you know, a county race, city race, a state race, or a federal race. I think what you need to think about is what you want to accomplish. How do you want to serve your community? Uh, and what the opportunities are. Are there opportunities to run for different races you know maybe you've got maybe you've got a member of congress in delaware uh who you love we we have a member of congress in delaware who we love a lot in lisa Plum rochester uh so that might make that complicated uh until she decides to run for something else um, so you got to kind of look at what does the whole playing field look like where are the opportunities and also what are you most interested in so that's what i would do so you don't have to take anything off the table you want to take a look at it Awesome. Stephanie, thank you so much for writing this book. Thank you so much for everything that you have done to move women forward. And a personal thank you from me for showing me what it means to be a strong woman leading an organization. Thank you so much. And I'm going to hand it back to Jahana. Yes, thank you so much, Ashanti, as always, and Stephanie as well. One of the things I told Stephanie about the book, which I love and definitely have read, is that um, it felt like two girlfriends talking to one another. And one of the things I've so much appreciated, Stephanie, is how open you were about your advice in particular to um, women who, were who are reading this book and the men too, who are going to read it and certainly, you know, never be afraid to ask, you know, I need help. And this is definitely one of these books where you can ask, I need help and get the answers. So um, definitely well, hope everyone you. And can I just, I wanna say just one thing and I know we've got this amazing panel so I wanna give time to that. I just, uh, I have in my last week here of, of Emily's List uh, serving as president, but you never leave Emily's List. We are a family that sticks together forever and, and just know that I just am, so, so proud of everybody who's joining this call tonight, who's thinking about running for office, who's, who's even pondering uh, getting involved in public service in some capacity. It is truly a great blessing to have the opportunity to help our communities. And I've done that in this role at Emily's List and it's been just a wonderful, wonderful honor. And I'm just so excited to see where Run to Win continues to grow and under Johanna's leadership with her partners at, at the senior team at Emily's List, I have no doubts uh, we're gonna see great things. So thank you all for taking the time and thank you for giving me this moment to just say, I'm so honored to be part of this family, this community, and I always will be. Thank you. And I know you're gonna just stick around for a few seconds to help me welcome our amazing panelists that I'm now thrilled to introduce. Um, so we have three incredible elected leaders who are joining us for this conversation about their own experience as candidates. We have from Wake County, North Carolina, uh, where she represents Senate District 17, State Senator Sydney Batch. And then from Los Angeles, where she represents the 51st Assembly District, California Assemblywoman, Wendy Carrillo. And who also I had the pleasure of working with, with when I was on the Emily's List state and local team, so always good to see her. And from Fairfax County, Virginia, where she represents the 42nd District, uh, we have Delegate Kathy Tran, so welcome. And we have our little baby too. I know, I was like, okay. 
Kathy just he's awake just in time. Yeah, yeah. She, she beforehand was like, he's asleep, don't move everybody. But uh but yes, just gorgeous. And these three rising star incredible women just have done so much good work and will continue to do so much great work as they keep moving through their careers. And what, what an honor to to be with the three of you. And thank you for taking time out of your very, all three of you, your very busy schedules. Definitely. Well, thank you so much, Stephanie. And we're going to go ahead and get started with our panel. Take it on. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So as a reminder to our audience, please submit your questions in the Q&A chat box for our panelists. Looks like we're already getting some really good ones. So excited to um, get to those in just a bit. And also thank you to Nancy Leon, who's from my team, who's engaging our chat today. So thank you, Nancy, for um, being with us in the chat. All right. So welcome again to all of you. And thank you for being here today. Um, so I want to begin by having you all talk about the why question. We always tell candidates they need to be able to answer the number one question. Why are you running? And in your cases, why did you decide to run? Senator Batch, I'd like to start with you. Um, so prior to running for the first time, you served your community as a family law attorney, a child welfare advocate, and a social worker. What shifted that made you see yourself as a candidate? Um, so I would, I'd start off by saying that my name got on some list somewhere of someone who someone should call to say, hey, you want to run for office? Because I, um, unlike Stephanie and Ashanti, never thought about running for office at all. It's never um, on my radar until I actually was asked. The first time I was asked, my kids were three and five, and I said, nope. And then they came back again, and when they were five and seven, um, I finally decided to run. But I think a large part is because as an attorney court system, I was constantly beating my head against a wall. I was helping one family at a time, try and navigate a really broken system, trying to get the resources, trying to connect them with um, in different ways with services that would actually strengthen their families, et cetera. And then what it always came back down to is that there were two issues that I ran into. One, the law had to change because the laws that were actually being implemented were negatively affecting my clients. And then the other part was that the policy had to change. And the only way you can do that is either to be right in the in a government position, whether that be an office or whether that be a, in a policy shop within the government. And so I finally just decided after um, a long period of time that I could actually make effective change if I ran for office. At that time, there were only two social workers out of the 180 members in the 170 members in the General Assembly. Um, and they did not have that perspective. There were not any child welfare attorneys that were practicing as well. And so I just decided that if other people in that building that were going to pass laws had no context of what I was doing every single day and the struggles that I saw with families in and outside of the courtroom and what I was doing, they didn't value that. If they didn't prioritize that, then somebody needed to. And I uh, finally decided to go ahead and step forward and run. That's wonderful. Well, we're glad you did and talk about reflective democracy. Um, so thank you for that. So Assemblywoman Carrillo, you've worked um, to make a difference in so many ways, uh, both as, as a journalist, a labor union staffer, and even a staffer at for a Los Angeles city council member. Why did you decide it was your uh, time to put your name on the ballot? Well, thank you. And it's great to be with all of you amazing and incredible leaders. Um, I decided to run for office. I decided to run for office uh, in late 2015 um, after the presidential election. And this was a time in which the rhetoric was anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim, anti-women, anti-science, all the things, all the things that were happening at that moment. And I was at Standing Rock, North Dakota as a journalist covering the uh, Standing Rock uh, pipeline protest and uh, all the water protectors that were there. And I was inspired to run having been a formerly undocumented child myself. And between the ages of five and 13, I was undocumented and I was fortunate to have received residency and citizenship. And I thought, if not now, when, and if not me, who? And this was a, a special congressional, actually a congressional election uh, in 2016 that I, uh, did not win, uh, came close and, and established, uh, I think, a really good ground game and support, and then thought about what I was going to do with the rest of my life since I did not win that election, but my assembly member won, and then we were looking at, well, who was going to run for the assembly seat, for the state seat, and there was 12 men that put in their, their name to run for the seat, and no women 
and I was asking around and asking around and, and finally I thought, well, maybe I should consider it. And I started having the conversations and someone very powerful in Los Angeles told me, well, you know, if you run twice and you lose twice, your political career is over before it's even begun. And I was like, oh, really? Okay, watch me. So I did. So I decided to hashtag persist uh, immediately after uh, having lost the, the congressional special election and jumped into another special election and uh, was the only viable woman running against 11 other men that were running for the seat and came out as a top vote getter and won the election. And now I'm starting my, my fourth year. And I, I always said, and I continue to say, you know, no one needs to tell me and I don't need to run a poll about what the issues are in my community because I've lived them. I know what it's like to struggle. I know what it's like to be a first generation American trying to make it be a, the first one in my family to go to college, the first one to do a lot of the things that actually set the tone for upward mobility and, and really the, the importance of the Latino community uh, in the United States and establishing a bench of progressive uh, working class uh, you know, uh, candidates that can that can lead um, in our state and in our community. So I'm I'm grateful for Emily's list and and for the the assistance and the help and really the encouragement, as well as several other women's organizations that saw something um, that that was important. And I would say this also: even when you choose to run and you lose, it's how you lose and how you lose with dignity. I think that at the end of the day says a lot about who you are, the values that you have, and your ability to move forward. So that's why I ran. Uh, that's why I continue to do the work necessary and why I'm excited to be a part of this panel and also just hear from all the, 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 two, other, the two other electeds across our country in terms of what we can do to ensure that there are more women at the table and not just at the table, but once we are there, it changes the conversation. When I have conversations about immigration reform, in my own experience, it changes the tone and direction of that conversation, as well as the many other issues that, that we all have to advocate for. So we need more women, we need a diverse group of women, and we need to make space for those type of voices. Absolutely, and diverse voices is exactly what we need. And you said, if not me, when, if not now, when, you know, when. Um, and so I think we're always the leaders we're waiting for, right? So it's important for us to know that we should just jump in and run. Um, so Representative Tran, how did your professional experience with the US Department of Labor and as an immigrant attorney, as well as having a very powerful personal story factor into your decision to run for the first time? I think, uh, well, thank you. I similar to um, as someone woman, uh, Carrillo, I was really motivated um, just to think more deeply about kind of my role after the presidential election in 2016. At that time, I was pregnant with my fourth child, uh, so this is number five, but I was pregnant with my fourth child and due on inauguration day. And so, um, you know, we decided to name uh her Elise, she had a baby girl, Elise Minkun. And Elise was inspired by Ellis Island. My husband had family that passed through Ellis Island and their search for opportunity in America as they were escaping anti-Semitism at the turn of the century. And Minkun is Vietnamese for Bright Bell. My family uh, were Vietnamese boat refugees in the early 80s. And we came here um, because for us, America was a land of hope and opportunity and freedom. Uh, so uh, Min Khan, uh, meaning Bright Bell, was inspired by the Liberty Bell. And to us, her name means to ring the bells of liberty and champion opportunity for all. And I made the decision to run when she was a month old. I saw these postings about, hey, we need somebody to run in the 42nd House District. And at that time, I honestly was like, is that my district? You know, is that where I live, right? Um, I was working as a civil servant in the uh, U.S. Department of Labor uh, for 12 years and then went on to work in immigration uh, reform right. at the national level. And so I had always been somebody kind of writing white papers, looking at best practices, following policy and politics, but never in my wildest dreams thought I would be here in this seat now. Um, but I felt that calling that so many of us did in that this was the time to, you know, roll up my sleeves to get involved and do everything I could to shape the future for my kids. Um, and, you know, Elisa's name means uh, to 
ring the bells of liberty and champion opportunity for all. And that was really what inspired me to jump into into politics. Um, but even now when people say, oh, I, you know, when I knock on doors, I remember in, some, in 2017, my uh, first election and they, um, somebody said, never had a politician come into my house and knock before. I'm like, where's that politician? And I was like, oh, I'm just a mom, you know? And I, that's how I still see myself. And that's the lens through which I do all of my work as a mom of five now, as an immigrant, a woman of color, um, just trying to lift up our communities, every opportunity I can get. But um, I also have a social work background, so love, love meeting other social workers too. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing that and beautiful to know the, the stories behind your children's names. So um, we've all talked a little bit about the why. Now let's talk a little bit about the how, right? How did you all prepare to run for office? So Assemblywoman Carrillo, um, what did you do to prepare for your first campaign? So I was very fortunate in my, my first election for Congress that I had, again, this is you know the, the 2016 election and I had friends that had been working for uh, Senator Sanders as well as um, Hillary Clinton, Secretary Clinton for her campaign as well. And so my, camp, my special election was the first one following uh, the 2016 presidential that brought these two groups together. And they literally, sat me down for two days and made me go through every single contact that I had on my phone, on social media, on LinkedIn, on Instagram, on any platform you could possibly imagine and create a master list of contacts. And then once I cleared up the data, I was asked to put two different columns on the Excel sheet. One was ask and then give, meaning how much money was I gonna be able to raise to actually run an effective campaign? That was the first thing that I did. And to be quite honest, it's, it's a list that I continuously uh, go back to and add to because running campaigns is expensive. It's also, you, it's like running a small business and you have to hire a campaign manager, a treasurer, a political data person, like all kinds of these, these jobs that you have to obviously pay people to, to, um, to help you with. And it's great to have you know the volunteers and, and that's amazing. But at the end of the day, you also need to get your message out to constituents. And the only way that you do that is by having the funds to do so. So I would say if you are considering running for office, get your data list in order. Uh, if you are thinking about supporting somebody that's running for office, make sure that they get this part done because it is critical um, in ensuring a, a, uh, a really great uh, and robust campaign that ultimately gets your message out. Absolutely, absolutely it is. And on our training center at emilyslist.org, we talk about this, but one of the things we always tell women as they're thinking about this process is, we just know you're gonna, we need to know if you're gonna do the hard work. We'll teach you the rest. So yeah. definitely we can teach you how to roll a decks, how to do everything that uh, uh, Assemblywoman Carrillo did, but we just wanna know you're gonna put in the hard and, work. And you have, the hard work is actually being on your phone and calling people and not being afraid of asking for money. I remember somebody very early on told me I was really nervous about asking people to help me. And they said, you're asking people to invest in the vision that you have for your community. This is not money that's going in your pocket. Like this is about the values that you bring to the table. And once I got over that, once I got over my own like insecurity, then it, it was a game changer because I, I was talking about the work that needed to get done and the values that brought us to the table. Um, and people were more supportive once they knew that I was confident in myself and getting the work done. Absolutely. Representative Tran, we'll go back to you. So what were the first steps you took once you decided to run? Um, I just have to say before, before I share my first steps, thank you for that pep talk. I am in my reelection year this year. We have elections in Virginia. I'm doing call time. I needed to hear that <laughs> uh, because uh, I, I don't think it's fun nor easy sometimes. But I will say um, I knew nothing about campaigns. I mean, I like, you know, was in my PTA, did my work, you know, involved in the community in other ways, but not politically. I knocked doors for the first time on my wedding anniversary in 2016 uh, for Hillary Clinton, right? The boys and my husband went down one street and I and, and my daughter went down another street. And so um, I took an Emerge uh, Virginia boot camp, and uh, I remember sitting there at least for one month, and it was like 
it was honestly overwhelming to learn about all the different aspects of a campaign. And it is certainly uh, like having your own business and it and being a candidate is a job and it's not going to get done and you're not going to win unless you put the time and effort and energy into it. Um, but I, I, I mean, this is how naive I was. I remember interviewing um, campaign managers and I was like, am I going to see you every day? Like, we're, well, can't we just meet in the coffee shop? You know, like, it's like, how does this work? But, um, but going through a training was really helpful. It just demystified the process, right? Um, it talked, you learn about fundraising and all the ins and outs of how to do it. And there's no secret to it. It's the same formula that we, we all use, but you have to put the time into it. Uh, you learn about the comms piece, um, what you need to do to reach your voters and uh, kind of how you build your staff and what your message is gonna be. And also, you know, for me going through the Emerge Virginia uh, training, it just helped me be in touch with a fantastic group of women that were running in 2017. You know, those of us that went on to win and have been serving together, it's just been a real family that we were able to, uh, to kind of create through that experience together. And I think that unless you've been in, a, in unless you have, you are a candidate, possibly if you lived with a candidate or worked on a campaign, it's hard to understand the experience. It's truly a crucible, but I think it's made me stronger. Um, I am now in my second reelection cycle and I've feel like I've grown immensely as a candidate. And I think you could be really policy wonky and love the community and give back, but there's a difference between being a candidate and when you then get into office to legislate. Um, so I think that's why it's import so important. And there's so many organizations doing trainings for women uh, to, to get plugged in and to get that assistance. Absolutely. And certainly you all sharing your stories help normalize this process for many, many women. So thank you for that. Senator Batch, how did you prepare to, uh, for the work ahead once you decided to run? Uh, so everything that Wendy and Kathy shared as well. And then I'll talk about the, the life experience, right? The things that you, that your life changes because people don't, you, you don't know it until you're in it. And, um, and so that what I ended up doing was I read a book because I was worried as one of the uh, questions with Steph, uh, it, that was asked to Stephanie from a person in the audience was, you know, do you have the confidence? Am I ready? Do I know enough? Right. And so I read a book because Stephanie's was not written, uh, which is called the confidence code for women. And it really was talking about the challenges, both biologically, you know, like, what our amygdala does, what how women and men are different, and how society necessarily changes, and so, so um, you know, and, and sociologically, why we are a certain way. I read that book to get over, you know, the the fear of am I ready and can I really do this? Um, and so that was a really fantastic book. I also, at that time, um, had a really serious conversation about expectations. Frankly, with my husband, we learned very early on that. Uh, I think probably the, a month in of me campaigning, he called and said, we have, our kids have too many clothes. I'm going to throw half of them out. And I'm like, you just have to wash twice as much. And he says, it's just a lot. And I'm like, yeah, that's how it works. And he says, I'm really sorry for the past 12 years. I've never washed clothes, right? Like I've never, ever in my life taken on this burden and I'm sorry. And so I tell people some of the best things that have ever happened to me for running for office is I've only lost, washed 10 loads of clothes in 10 years. I mean, in the past four years, right? Where I did it all, he now just does it. But those are some of the serious conversations you need to have with your partner, with family members, because the reality is you're not gonna be there. And I had to have the same very difficult conversations with my five and seven year old and shift my time and work around my mom guilt and part of what I did, knowing that I had all of these things going through my head is I went ahead and went to, to therapy. I was like, let me get into therapy. Let me sit down. Let me try and figure out how I'm going to manage working full time as a law partner in my firm, being available for my family, running for office. And then in North Carolina, it's a part time legislature. So it only pays you $14,000, which means you still got to keep your job. So I had all of these things that were happening at the same time and just didn't know how to manage that all. And so I, those are the three things that I thought were by far the most helpful in us in me trying to transition and prepare, knowing that I had these fears and the best way to address it was head on and, and really coming up with some really effective coping mechanisms and support systems in place in order to be successful. Absolutely. Yeah, the support system is key, especially as you're thinking about running, you know, for office and certainly friends, family, organizations, neighbors, all of them are going to play a role. It does really take a village. <laughs> um, so the theme of today is really about sharing lessons. So I want to shift a little to talk about the lessons you all learned in your running for office. So Representative Tran, 
we know that there are some things that we can prepare for, and there are some things that we learn along the way. So what are some lessons you learned about running for office after you officially became a candidate? Um, you know, I think that you just have to be who you are and you can't be somebody else. And I think that is the most important thing. And uh, as an Asian American woman, I remember um, some very well-meaning folks were like, well, no, I really think you need to talk like this and express yourself this way. Um, and my amazing campaign manager was like, please don't cry on the doors. I'm like, but sometimes I get moved, right? And so they're all, there's all this advice. Um, and I realized I can't talk any louder than I do now. I am going to wave my arms when I get excited, right? And sometimes I'm going to cry on the doors when people share really moving stories um, and how they feel connected to me and the values that I'm bringing to the table and in my vision. And that's okay, right? And I think that um, it gets back to the confidence piece sometimes. And there's, you know, a campaign is, is there's lots of highs and then there's going to be those low moments. And the other pieces have a group of folks who have your back. Um, you know, whoever those people are, whether they're in your family or your neighbors or folks you can just call, but you need that because you're going to need those pep talks uh, every so often when, when the campaign ebbs and flows. But um, I, I remember when I was getting all this advice about how I needed to, to behave on the campaign trail, I called up um, a mentor and I was like, you know, I'm getting, I, I'm not quite sure what to do. She's like, that none of those things are you. You should just be you and do that. And I said, all right, that's who I am. And you got to embrace that. Um, and the other piece I'll say is, you know, it, it was interesting, um, some of the comments I got on the doors. I remember in 17, there were a lot of talk about um, from women being like, we were getting comments like, why are you campaigning dressed like that in the dead of summer in, you know, in tropical Virginia, right? Like, um, and so you, you got to be comfortable and be confident. And I just, um, you know, somebody said to me, I don't know if we're ready for you. You're this like former refugee. You have all these little kids. And I was like, all right, well, you know, I'll show you. Right. And now look, y'all are ready for me and I am doing my work and it's working out. Right. But, but you, you're going to get that. Um, and so you just have to make sure that you are, you, you have the folks who have your back. Um, and then anytime you need help, reach out because Look at this amazing group of folks, and, and there's many more of us, not enough, but more of us who are willing to lift you up and ready to do so at any moment. Absolutely. Absolutely. Running as your authentic self is really key and very important. Assemblywoman Carrillo, you had experience as a political staffer and some sense of what to expect. What were some of the things that you were surprised to learn once you were the candidate? Wow, uh, so many lessons, but I was surprised at how quickly you lose your self-identity. Mm -hmm. So when you're running, when people know you as yourself, right? You're just Wendy, you're just, you know, the girl from East LA, whatever, doing all the things. Um, and then when you're running, it changes. And what was most surprising to me was people that I knew talking about me on social media, but not picking up the phone and actually calling or or asking questions you know it was like I became like this this other thing mm -hmm. and that was really and continues to be uh, a thing that I that I struggle with that I you know I'm, I'm challenged with in terms of I'm still a human being like I'm still a woman I'm still like your friend I'm still like you know the person that I was and that will be even when my term is over and so that's that was also like a a lesson in terms of they tell you to grow thick skin and it's an it's an interesting concept because you can be uh, i'm sorry they tell you to grow thick skin right not take anything personally but at the end of the day like we still have a soft underbelly like we still are you know either we are uh, inspired or we are hurt by the realities of of the work and the job and and how incredibly stressful it, it all is but I, I would agree with with Kathy in terms of just be yourself. I remember when I was when I was running, I wanted to show up to um, some campaign events uh, with my chucks, and like you know, people were like, "No, that's very unprofessional. Don't do that." And now we have Vice President Harris, who like made it so famous. I was like, I could have shown up to the rallies in my chucks and my jeans and my blazer, and I would have been fine, you know. But they there's this image that you have to convey as a woman and you get 
uh, treated and judged for all kinds of different things, like what you wore, what color your lipstick is, how your hair is, like things that men don't ever have to worry about uh, are things that women, sadly, we get judged on. Um, and so that continues to be a thing until I think there's more parity in women elected officials where it's just normal now. Mm -hmm. um, so those those were some some pretty harsh lessons uh, very early on that continue to be you know things that that are important I think that we recognize in terms of the challenges that women face when running for office and when once we're elected. Absolutely, absolutely, Senator Batch, you've overcome so many barriers on your own journey. Um, what welcome? What uh, excuse me? What lessons did you learn in your run for office? Yeah, so um, I, I just also have to add, people told me I had to wear a suit and put on makeup. And I was like, I am an attorney who doesn't wear a suit in court. I'm certainly not about to put one on in, on, in during this campaign. And I still don't wear makeup but a couple of times, right? So again, as Kathy and Wendy have said, you just gotta be authentic who you are wherever you show up. I don't have makeup on today. It's like got to be a real special, this is a special occasion golf, but it has to be like a huge, like a, my wedding is where I'm putting on makeup. Um, so uh, to your point, um, so I, I did have a lot of adversity in my first term. I mean, my first uh, in 2018, um, while I was running, I got diagnosed with breast cancer in August um, of that election year. And so left and took three Three weeks off in September to have a mastectomy, uh, and then came back and ran the rest of my campaign. Um, so I had um, what I what I learned outside of the fact that I didn't realize that I could handle as as much as I could um, is that I've, the takeaway from that process and even serving now is that I really believe that the fire within you has to burn much much brighter and much stronger than the fire around you, um, and because it's going to be tough. There are going to be days where you want to quit. I mean, I, and no one would have blamed me. And I would not ever say to anyone if, who was diagnosed in the middle of a campaign, hey, you know, what? it's a little too much and to step aside. But I thought about all of the other women and all the other families and all the other voices that I was trying to speak for and to represent. And if I would have stopped running at that time, then they wouldn't have someone who was there to go ahead and use their platform then to talk about healthcare and the importance of Medicaid expansion and Carolina that we still don't have. And the opportunities for so many who, I was very fortunate, right? I'm self-employed, I, I couldn't get fired, right? So uh, there were things that I could do and use my voice to elevate a platform and voices of others that, um, that were not able to, to do so um, and did not have the same fortunes and, um, and good graces that I've had. So that was definitely a challenge and it was very hard. And I'd also just add um, that it, what Wendy said before is really important. I had a brutal 2020 race. Many women across this country did, and I didn't lose. I, I lost my reelection for the North Carolina House. I was recently appointed to the Senate seat that opened up unexpectedly. Um, but I always tell my kids that you've got to be, uh, in order to be a good winner, you got to be a good loser. And you've got to figure out a way to lose with grace and to understand that there are opportunities that come with every single loss. And that if you don't take a lesson, like the, the loss is when you don't take a lesson from it. And I didn't take that as a personal slight to me. It, races are just tough and everyone didn't expect 2020. Thank God the federal level worked out. Um, but with all of that said, I think that it's really just important to remember why you're doing it. And to know that they're gonna be bad days. But again, if you're doing it for the right reasons, that passion will drive you to continue to push through some of the most difficult times in your life. Absolutely, absolutely. Wonderful. So I wanna take just some very, very quick um, questions from our audience and maybe do a little bit of a lightning round. So just like a quick uh, answer. So we have Teresa who asks, I wanna run for office, but I'm deeply afraid of public speaking. Do you have any advice on building confidence? And we'll start with uh, uh, Assemblywoman Carrillo. So I have a background in, in comms and I would just say um, the thing that got me through it uh, was thinking to myself, if I don't do it, who else will? Who else is gonna deliver the message that I need to deliver to my community? And it wasn't about me anymore. It was about the needs. So if you, are, uh, if you have stage fright, it's okay. I would say hold something in your hand so that when you're feeling nervous, you can squeeze it. And it could be something very small, a paper clip, a pen, whatever, so that you're, you're, um, you are distracted by what you're squeezing versus what you intend to say um, as a method of just trying to um, get over your stage fright. I love it. Here's my lipstick. That's what I've been using um, all, all this time. All right, so <laughs> Angela asks, what are some ways to connect with your community and uh, the local party to launch your campaign? 
um, will uh, Representative Tran. Yes. Uh, so one advice I got, I think it's really helpful, is to reach out to your local Democratic committee. Um, if you're, you're not in an election cycle right now, just become a member and get involved and know people, right? But remember, your local committee is only one portion of the folks who, folks who come out to vote. Um, you'll have lots of other people who come out to vote who aren't involved. And so just, just keep that in mind. The other thing is introduce yourself to your local elected officials, whether it's at your county, city, town level and your local state electeds. Um, and I, throughout my campaign in 17, called people up and just said, hey, I'm Kathy, I'm running for office, this is who I am. They'll be like, how much money have you raised? How many doors have you knocked? So have a good number ready. Call, on, call it a good week. But I never asked them for money. I was just trying to build relationships and let them know who I am and that I'm putting in the work that it takes to win. But that, that I thought that was uh, really good advice. And after I got elected, I heard from elected officials saying, I got all these candidates calling me all the time for money and I didn't know who they were. And so it's really just helpful to build that relationship. And when you're towards the end of your race and they see you needing that extra nudge and you've been doing that work, um, they will sometimes drop you a check and that's really helpful, but build the relationship. Great, one more question. So Teresa, um, sorry, here we go. Uh, Teresa asks, um, Oh, I apologize. Anika. Anika asks, do you have any advice for potential candidates with limited financial resources? Probably 30 seconds, Senator Sidney Batch. Um, yes, what I would say is that if you can start doing small donations and so people who don't like I didn't put more than $500 in my first campaign and that my, my position is if you can't get other people to invest in you, that might say something about whether or not people want to, you know, maybe you're the not the right candidate. I didn't have a lot of resources. It's not like that my family had a ton of money, but what I did do is I went and I said, hey, can you give $5? Can you give $10? I think that we underestimate the amount of recurring dollars that we can get for some people. So just say, hey, can you do a $5 Starbucks latte instead of giving me $100? And if you get them on a recurring, they will forget about the fact that it's just $5. And so look for those, like don't always ask for the max out check or 500, 100, uh, $25, $10, $15, whatever they can give really adds up. And I would just encourage you to try and ask them to do a recurring amount. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you all so much for being here, for sharing your stories. I know that the women that are listening today were inspired by everything that you shared, your lessons learned. So again, thank you so much. And for all of you who are joining us today, I hope you get a chance to pick up your own book of Stephanie's, uh, your own book. And we actually are going to put in a link uh, on the chat uh, where you can pick it up. Where um, So hopefully you'll use it in your own journey um, as you run for office. Um, I also want to, again, thank uh, Senator Sydney Batch, Assemblywoman Wendy Carrillo, and Representative Kathy Tran for bravely putting your name on the ballot and by doing so changing really the perception of leadership. And thank you to Ashanti for being a co-conspirator with Emily's List uh, for so many years and challenging the system's rules. And to Stephanie Shriok, our fearless leader, thank you for being an agent of change and helping to knock down barriers for so many women that have allowed them to win, uh, to run and to win. And thank you, all of you who are joining us today for sharing your time, getting all your good energy and all your awesome questions. We greatly appreciate it. I know we're gonna see you hopefully soon at another event. Um, and until then, just wanna say thank you so much for joining us and thank you all of you. Have a good night. Thank you and stay safe. Stay safe. Thank you. Have a good night. Have a good night.